Ireland's London office. I joined yeah. the organization back in September and I'm working closely with Dara Cotter, who leads the work on our water and wastewater supply chain cluster in the UK. The cluster comprises of over 70 companies who are well positioned to service the UK's municipal and industrial water sectors and their respective capital and growth objectives. For those of you unfamiliar with Enterprise Ireland, we are the Irish Development Agency for Trade and Innovation, supporting over 5,000 companies to scale and grow internationally. We have over 40 offices across the globe. And in the UK, we have offices in London and in Manchester. Here, our sector specialists provide Irish SMEs with market intelligence and knowledge from the UK. We also work with UK-based companies to help them source the latest innovation coming out of Ireland, as well as help them to build long-term partnerships with relevant Irish SMEs. The UK water sector's AM7 cycle began just under a year ago. In fact, many of you uh, will have been present in London early last March uh, for the Enterprise Ireland event marking the, the start of the new spending cycle. As we all know, two weeks after the, uh, that event, the world changed completely. And since then, the UK water sector itself has undergone some significant changes. This morning, we'll take a closer look at the impact of COVID-19 on the industry and the sector's priorities uh, for the remaining four years of AMP7. We will assess what this means for the supply chain on a practical level before turning our attention to the net zero agenda in the UK water industry and what this means for supply chain companies working in the sector. So on this side here, uh, we have an agenda and I'm glad to say we have an excellent lineup of expert speakers joining us this morning. So first we have Lee Horrocks, uh, Director at LCH Executive, who will uh, provide an update on the AMP7 cycle one year in. Next, Lila Thompson, Chief Executive of British Water, will discuss the effects that the COVID-19 pandemic has had in the sector and on the supply chain. After Lilla, Samuel Larson, Programme Lead at Water UK, will discuss the sector-wide Net Zero 2030 route map, which was published last November. Finally, er, after, er, finally David Riley, uh, Head of Carbon Neutrality at Anglian Water, will discuss what this route map means for our supply chain companies working in the sector. There will be an opportunity for questions after each presentation. So if you have any questions, please post them in the chat or questions to have that can be found in the control panel on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, we'll be monitoring your questions and Dara and I will relay these to the speakers after the presentation. If we don't get to all of the questions, we'll make sure to pass them on to the speakers after the event. And just so you know as well, the webinar is being recorded and you'll be sent a recording of the session later today. Lastly, I'd like to sincerely thank all of our guest speakers for their time and contribution this morning, and to all of you in the audience as well for taking the time out to join us today. For now, I will pass over to our first speaker, Lee Horrocks, if you want to kick off, Lee. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody, and, and thank you, Luke. I, I think the idea is that I'll just remain on screen and the other presenters will go on, uh, will turn their videos off, which will help the transition speed of the uh, of the information and hopefully everybody can see and hear me so my, my job as Luke said is to try and give you the contractors view of, of uh, where we are in AMP7 particularly in relation to the end of year one and where we are with with respect to COVID the, my title there is uh, I do direct work with Enterprise Island as a water sector strategic consultant and hopefully we'll be able to work with, with some of you guys going forward. We can jump the slide, please, Luke. Thank you. So just a, a quick look back, pre-lockdown three, which is what it's called over here in England. I'm sure you have different terms over in Ireland. Where were we without seven? A number of key drivers, customer satisfaction, innovation, efficiency, the environment, um, the determinations have been issued by the regulator. Four companies actually went to appeal, which is still to be formally decided. Um, the majority of the AMP7 partner delivery frameworks had been procured by the water companies across tier ones for infrastructure, non-infrastructure, consultants, MICA, process, etc. 
and to be fair a number of the amp six uh tier one partners were rolled on for another five years because that was the deal that they had in place at the start of amp six which would clearly be let me let my mass work it out at the start of 2015. the other part of amp six were the amp seven was that the the regulator and the the plcs were looking for tier twos and smes and equipment suppliers to have a much higher profile in amp seven than in amp six and, and, and why was that well they believe that these businesses bring efficiency bring innovation certainly bring knowledge value for money and that they're quite good at collaboration but i think an important point to to show here that at the start of amp seven so in effect pre uh, any COVID-19 impacts. There wasn't enough capacity or capability to deliver the AMP7 programme within the English, uh, Northern Ireland, Scottish and Welsh capability. Click please, Luke. Uh, and in fact, when AMP7 started in April, a really good thing, and it's something to consider that it, by default, the sector was deemed essential works and in fact is recession proof so in varying ways and i'll go to that in a little more in a second the sector kept working even through uh, even through covid uh, and in fact the government and the regulators wrote to the water companies to ask them to look to bring work forward to help to use them to help with the country's recovery in theory post lockdown in the uh, lockdown in the summer but that continues even to today next slide luke So throughout COVID, what has been happening uh, as far as the water companies and the, and the contracting fraternity is concerned? Well, there have been differing approaches. Everybody's been working really hard to keep to keep the supply chain going. You know, from one end in, in Scottish water in lockdown one, only essential works took place. Uh, but throughout this, some companies have just worked with minimal stoppages, for example, Seven Trent. Important to know now that even in lockdown three, the companies are back up to circa 80% of the of the pre-COVID delivery capacity. Wherever possible, the sector has been trying to support people who work in it. So obviously you guys, if you look to get, get involved in the UK water sector, people have been designated as essential workers, work scope and programs have been revised to meet the requirements of COVID, working methods for COVID-19 have been, been implemented accepting reduced delivery efficiency because of COVID-19 has become the norm. Um, in During the summer, the water PLCs reduced payment terms to help uh, companies such as yourselves to retain cash positive, albeit they've now moved back to the contractual norms. And the tier one contractors that sort of received most of that payment from the client passed these payments on to their tier twos and their supply chain. But, but obviously we're now back to sort of contractual norms. Thing to, to note that, contract, that COVID-19 is now the new normal way of working in terms of processes and procedures, both at, both at home, in offices and, at, and working out on site. Interesting to see that Northumbrian have actually put in internal testing for COVID-19 for their own staff on a regular basis. And something you might want to think about is CITB have set up a free uh operating as i say covid construction site training course which you can access online and the uh the link is shown there in the slide but obviously you'll get that when the slides are circulated from luke uh, next slide please luke so continuing what was going on so even though lots of businesses were having to work out how they operate people working from home people working remotely not being able to get into offices obviously people being sick with covid so their capacity was reduced procurement initiatives continued thames water awarded 700 million plus of frameworks in july northumbrian water are currently procuring infrastructure and non-infrastructure frameworks as are scottish water um, they're also gone out for geographical, smaller not infrastructure and mica type frameworks. And then a really interesting thing is Anglin just announced the biggest ever single spend in 2021 at 630 million single, single, single year spend. So even though COVID is happening, lots of money is still spent in this sector. Next slide. Next click, Luke, please. 
something that you might want to be looking at relatively quickly. Northern Ireland are about to come to market with £1.2 billion pounds of major project procurement. It's a partnering framework um, for civil engineering design consultants, contractors, process engineering contractors. That comes to market in April. Next click, Luke. And UK Wartner Partnerships have set up a capabilities directory, which obviously the link's there. So you can actually go out and look at what capabilities and capacities are in the marketplace and where you could potentially get involved. Next slide, please. So I think another sort of important message is to say, we've now got even less capacity and capability to deliver AMP7. The fundamental reason behind that is the volume of work that was planned from April 20 to March 21 didn't take place. There was a lot of work done, but nowhere near the volumes that were intended to be delivered. That work has not been stopped, it's just been moved back. So in effect, what the, the English PLC is now having to do is to plan five years of work or circa five years of work into four. So there's more work being awarded, and, and in some instances, this is potentially being seen as undeliverable based on pure volumes at a point in time during years, years three and years four of, of the AMP7 cycle. So the companies and the contractors are keen to take more risks. They're keen to do more money. Why that? Why is that? Because they need to deliver more work. They need to cut costs. They're really looking to save power. And as we'll hear in a, a little in much more detail in a little while, they're looking to improve the environment and to reduce carbon emissions. Servicing the customer is now a much, much higher priority than it's been in the past. And lots of the work is more mica driven today than it was, you know, civil engineering construct construction 10, 15 years ago. Innovation is critical, new ideas, new options, new possibilities. So those of you that have got those up your sleeve. Now is the time to, to start to bring them into the marketplace. And they're also looking to learn from other sectors. And I'm sure a number of you on this call work in other sectors than just water and can bring that knowledge and capability to, to the water sector. Everybody is looking to promote people up the value chain because they have ideas and they have opportunities, they have equipment and they have solutions which we really need to use. And everybody needs additional capacity and innovation just to help them to deliver the frameworks that they've been awarded and are looking to complete the delivery of by March um, 2025. Next slide, please, Luke. So something to think about following this and sit in the read, sit in reading all the slides that you will get circulated. What are your routes to market? Um, and there are a number of them talking directly to the water companies there's innovation teams and managers who are looking for to develop innovations and actually looking to take proven innovations that aren't necessarily used into the sector that's technical process digital um, procurement teams are looking to understand the future workload so you can see where you may or may not be able to get involved and what volume that may create for yourselves Tier one consultants, such as people like uh, Mark McDonald, Arcadis and ACOM are involved in specific pro projects directly for the PLCs. They are also involved in delivery of those projects at project level with, with tier one partners. But here you can, see, you can talk to design teams and design leads about the solutions that they need to find to the problems that they've got, both single ones and repeating. And they're also looking to reduce risk. And if you can help them with that, your, your services will be more than welcome. There's also an object to look at, pro, talk to project managers about cost and program savings where you can do the same thing, but actually do it for, for better value and, and save time. Tier one and tier two contractors are delivering specific projects. So meeting with project managers and commercial managers will get you involved in the work that's actually being delivered on the ground today and for the next three or four years. There's lots of opportunities because they're looking to reduce risk, they're looking to save money, and they're looking to add capacity into their supply chain. How can you do this? 
Well, I think the advice that Enterprise Ireland give and I always give is it, it comes from a multifaceted approach. Don't don't just use one route. Uh, develop a plan that covers a number of routes, a strategic growth plan, and focus that on what you are marketing, what your USPs are, and where you think they will have a direct impact into the sector. Create actions and timescales. You can contact the direct water companies direct, the consultants or the contractors direct. You can use Luke and Dara and your other contacts within Enterprise Ireland to help you to find the route into marketplace. You could join British Water, and I'm sure Lilla will tell you a little bit more about British Water in a while, so I won't steal her thunder, other than to say this is the leading trade body in the sector. And then the final option that you could use, slide please, Luke. is the support of ER uh, Enterprise Island and myself. If you look at that slide, uh, that covers just about all the water PLCs, the majority of the tier ones contracting entities, the majority of the consultants that operate in this sector, and a number of the key process and MICA contracting organizations in the sector as well as a couple of, of water bodies. Between myself uh, and Dara and Luke, we have contacts in just about every single one of those entities. Personally, I have worked with them in either as an employee um, or as a partner or as, as in competition with them. So we know lots of people and we know the routes that are available to you to get into the marketplace. And I would encourage you to talk to us about how that might work best for yourself, uh, because what we would want to do is to focus our attention on helping you as an individual business and picking the right route for yourself into the market sector, which uh, in my experience of working with Enterprise Ireland for the last 12 months, tells me it's very different for every business um, and we would really want to do that. Final slide, Luke, thanks. My contact details are there. Obviously, you know Luke and, and Dara well, so you can contact uh, any of us to try and help you. And I would then say I am happy to take any questions that may have come up, Luke or Dara. Thanks, Lee. Um, really comprehensive uh, overview there. C can you hear me, first of all? I can, yes. Great stuff. Um, yeah, just, just some questions uh, coming through, Lee. Um, maybe the first one we might go to is, um, how much of the AM7 frameworks and contracts haven't yet been awarded? Is it too late for Irish SMEs to, to bid for work? Uh, I think the probably honest answer to that is, um, at direct level to the uh, the delivery PLCs, so the UUs, the Thames Waters, the Seven Trents of this world, the answer is yes, they've probably all been let. Um, but I would say that even if they haven't, new business entrants into this marketplace will find it very difficult to go directly to English PLCs and secure work because they're clearly looking for a for a track record and. Uh, proven capability in the marketplace. The next one or two levels down from the PLCs is where uh, I, we would encourage the businesses to target, and there is lots of work. Frameworks have been let, but actual projects, a, a number have been let, but, but a number for the first year of the program. We're now just entering the second, starting to enter the second year, and there's another four years to go. And as, as I said earlier, a bunch of the work that should have been let in the first year hasn't. So there's even more work to do in the next four years. So at the top level, I think the answer is there's no possibility. But at the next levels down, there's a wealth of opportunities. OK. Um, second question, Lee. Um, would you encourage Irish SMEs to consider partnering together when uh, when bidding for work in Amsterdam? Um, I think the answer to that question is is both yes and no. Uh, and, and the driver behind the, the yes part of it is 
need to look at the opportunity and to see whether there is a uh, a clear advantage to, to work together. Uh, and interestingly enough, two of the businesses that I'm currently working with through Enterprise Island are, have both gone for opportunities in their own right, but they've actually also gone for, for opportunities together. So, so it's look at the opportunity, see whether your skills are complementary, um, and see whether it, it appears to add an advantage for you to work together on the opportunity. People like Dara uh, and Luke and myself are happy to guide and advise you on the opportunities if we think there's to see whether there's a potential for you working together or maybe it's better for you to go for them in isolation. Absolutely, I think that's something that we're always keen to to uh, to scope out within EI is is the opportunity or, or the potential um, for for our companies to work together in, in the UK um, where it makes sense, of course. Um, yeah. Another question, Lee. Um, how, and I know it's something you, you touched on already, but how important is having a well thought out uh, business and growth plan for the UK market? That's 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 my own question, really. <laughs> um, <laughs> how, how important is that? So, so do you? It, 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 there's a couple of ways of answering the question. Is it a ticket to the game? I.e., you, you must have a well thought out plan before you you enter the marketplace. The answer to that question is no. Is it a really, really good idea? Absolutely, yes. The marketplace is, is relatively huge. There are lots of routes into it. There are lots of opportunities. There are lots of businesses that you can talk to. So putting you know, a, a bunch of work in up front to identify the right areas that you want to target, which allow you to maximize your entry because of your skills and your capability, but also allow you to focus your marketing on a reduced number of, of businesses, a reduced number of individuals, so you get the maximum benefit from your effort, I, I think is it's the route that has been demonstrated to myself and to Dara to be in the one that maximizes the success. Um, you can do it the other way, but I would absolutely encourage you to do it, have a, to have a plan. And we are happy to work with you to to develop that plan to make it focused on you as your and your business and where you can maximize your exposure into the marketplace. That's that's a good point, Lee. And I think um, sometimes SMEs can, can find it hard maybe to identify um, whether it's the water utilities, the PLCs themselves, or or tier one contractors or consultants that they that they need to engage with. Um, so kind of identifying that route to market, identifying the, the, the customer base for an SME is, is really important. And I think that having a well thought out um, business plan um, facilitates that really. Um, yeah, I think just maybe maybe a simple example for, for people to understand. There's, there's a current business that I won't name. I would name it in one-to-one -one discussions, but not, not on a webinar, who, who entered the sector about six years ago and we worked together very hard to develop a plan uh, as to how, where they were going to get to. That business secured opportunities in about year two of AMP six, maybe year three, and then more opportunities in years four. And that business has literally just secured two tier one frameworks uh, for AMP seven because they, and that's because A, they had a focused plan, B, they stuck to the plan, and C, they work very, very hard at demonstrating their capability, both in terms of the bidding phases and the delivery phases of work when they secured it. That 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 will now net them probably 25 million a year for the next five years. That's a, a very impactful uh, example, Lily. <laughs> um, okay, I, I think I think um, I'm just conscious of the time. Um, I. I think what we'll now is, is uh, move on to Lila, if that's okay. Lee, thank you very much for yeah, no the problem. presentation. I'm, I'm around and... till the end if you need me, no problem. Perfect. Thank you, Lee. Hi, Lila. Hi. Hi. We, we can hear you just fine, so um, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. So, good morning, everyone. So, as Luke 
and Dara mentioned I'm Lilla Thompson, the Chief Executive of British Water, and I'm really delighted to be joining you all this morning. Uh, could you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So I'm joining you this morning to talk about the UK water sector and the impact of COVID-19 on the supply chain. So I'm going to share some perspectives with you and then hopefully you'll be able to um, challenge or um, ask me some questions around some of the points I'm going to raise and also some, some of the questions I'm going to pose at the end. So uh, at the outset of the pandemic, we started some weekly briefings and these were called Better Together webinars. So these webinars connected the supply chain to different people in the industry so that they could very, very easily get updates as to what was happening with regards to the end of AMP 6 and the start of AMP 7. Now, over the course of the Better Together webinars, we had 104 presentations from 75 speakers over 27 briefings. And we had presentations from a large number of representatives of the water companies and quite a number of water company CEOs and senior leaders. So that gave the supply chain a really, really good way to find out what was happening with projects, what was happening on site, where people are experiencing the same things, whether you're a contractor or a consultant or a supplier. So those were good ways for people to sort of check in and find out what was happening. Now, the initial feedback was that obviously there were lots of site closures and um, Lee's already mentioned this. And, and what happened in Scotland. There were concerns around cash flow and a number of the water companies made commitments to pay their invoices promptly to the supply chain. And again, I think Lee mentioned that. There was a great need for product updates and that came through frequently at the meetings and news as to what was happening and who, which members of staff were leading on certain projects. So we used the Better Together briefings to advise the supply chain as to what was happening. Also, there were concerns around key worker status. It was a bit sort of slow getting that status out for all of the workers across the supply chain, but that happened um, quite promptly. So, so that was good for the supply chain. They could go on site if they needed to. And I've already mentioned the issue around prompt payments. In the interim, there were continuing um, sort of comments we were getting back from the supply chain that some of the work that they were seeing coming through was still sort of work that was being carried over from AMP6 and that projects had been significantly de delayed um, from AMP 7. And again, Lee has mentioned that. Then there were um, feedback and comments we'll be getting back on the strategic review of charges and the price control 21. So Scotland and Northern Ireland were um, consulting and issuing their um, budgets and their plans for spend for water and wastewater projects. So we were tracking and monitoring those. Obviously, we heard in the news the issue around people more working from home and what that meant for water and wastewater and increased consumption and then obviously the, the market for the non-household market, how obviously the closure of restaurants and businesses were impacted um, and in terms of that impact on the water companies and their provision. So the thing that continued to come through was the visibility of needs. So companies were constantly saying that they appreciated the, the webinars and they really did need um, water companies and other partners in the industry to keep informing them as to what was going on. It was clear that companies that already were on framework agreements, obviously they knew what was happening. The current companies that were already working with water companies were aware of the projects that had been delayed or projects that were coming through. But if you're wanting to work with water companies, that information wasn't necessarily easy to access. And I'm going to touch on that a bit later. Obviously, as you know, in the press, the green recovery was mentioned. Um, obviously, they need to decarbonize the industry and accelerating and bringing projects forward. Um, that was highlighted quite early on. So there was a, a letter issued by Ofwat, DEFRA, the Environment Agency, inviting water companies to put forward projects um, that would help to accelerate the pace of economic recovery in the water industry. And I believe some of those projects are being currently considered by Ofwat and others. So in terms of the current situation, um, obviously, as Lee said, there definitely has been um, delays with regards to AMP7 work for the supply chain. We're hearing some of our supply chain companies report that um, some of their projects have been pushed back by about maybe nine months or six months. 
and what we're trying to do as a trade association is to assess um, how much that is actually happening across the supply chain so that we can um, provide that report back to Water UK with whom we have a, a very good relationship. Water UK is a trade body that represents the um, water utilities. Um, so we often have frequent meetings so that I can provide um, feedback to them and vice versa. Lee has mentioned the CMA appeals which are ongoing and um, I, we expect uh, final decisions on those soon. Obviously the net zero targets in England and Wales of 2030, Scotland's got their own of 2040. Uh, we hosted um, an event with Thames, well we hosted a water company liaison meeting with Thames, then they invited our supply chain companies to participate in their supply summit and then uh, Scottish Water had a net zero event as well. Uh, I know Anglin are going to touch on this as well. Um, so that was to help the supply chain companies to understand how they can help water companies on their net zero journey. And in particular, Scottish Water held an event. Um, there was a net zero event earlier in the year and British Water will be working with UK, Water UK to organize another one in um, the new year um, in April. So many of you will know that there's a 200 million pound innovation fund and, and that's been launched. And at the moment, there's a water innovation, channel, water innovation challenge for small companies to get involved in. Uh, one of the things that we will be uh, assessing is the take up of the fund by um, startups and SMEs, because obviously we want to see as many companies as possible working across um, the water companies who we know are doing a good job collaborating and working with companies, um, but we'd obviously like to see as many companies get involved as possible. Um, so if you haven't already got involved, do look at the Innovation Fund website, look at some of the key issues um, that are being addressed. And alongside that, do also monitor the Centre of Excellence. There's um, an innovation uh, strategy that's been launched, 2050 strategy that's been launched. And one of the key things as part of that is highlighting some key areas that water companies will be focusing on as part of the Innovation Fund and outside of the Innovation Fund. So that's an exciting piece of work that's coming through. One of the other things that we're discussing within British Water is whether we need to look again at cyclicality and its impact on the supply chain in terms of the peaks and troughs. We've um, already mentioned that there's going to be a large number of projects that are going to be squeezed within the next four years or three and a half years because we've missed the first year of AMP7. And do we have enough capacity within the supply chain to meet those orders? Um, so we're looking at the resources and the skills gap. Can I have the next slide, please? So one of the things that we did towards the end of last year was to carry out, carry out a supply chain impact survey. So this survey was sent out to members and non-members in October last year, and we had 178 respondents. So these are 178 different companies that responded to the survey. 37% were contractors, 22% were suppliers, 20% were manufacturers, and 16% were consultants. 70% at the time said their business turnover had decreased in the pandemic. 29% saying the decrease had been significant. 77% had to furlough staff, which is probably not surprising, and 27% had to make some redundancies. Just under 60% of companies reduced or furloughed staff to secure their cash flow position. 73% said they had not had any or had only limited problems with their own supply chains. The impact of COVID-19 on well-being, uh, on that of colleagues and others in the industry, was ranked as eight or nine out of 10, with 10 being the biggest impact. So clearly, as we know, COVID-19 had a massive impact on people's well-being. And then 35% expected the impact of COVID on their business turnover to stay about the same over the six, next six to 12 months, while 32% felt it would decrease and just 9% felt it would increase. Now, at the time of the survey, it was conducted just before the second lockdown. So we imagine that if we were potentially to do the survey again, we'd probably find slightly different responses. Um, so we will be issuing another survey just to assess how COVID-19 is impacting the survey. One of the things that we are finding is that lots of our companies are now saying, as Lee indicated, that work is 
starting to come through. But depending on where you are in the supply chain, um, there are still some sort of um, delays to the issuing of some projects. So we are just monitoring the impact of that. Next slide, please. So as the trade association for the supply chain of the UK water and wastewater industry, um, we do have um, a large number of companies in membership, which represent the whole sort of breadth of the supply chain. So we have consultants, contractors, manufacturers and suppliers. So every year we issue a water company performance survey, and, and that's usually issued in the summer of each year. And last year we issued the survey and that survey asks a number of questions. So it asks 11 questions of 12 water companies. And the questions are ranked um, in terms of how companies perceive their engagement with the water companies. And it asks questions in terms of how they engage with water companies in terms of um, the appetite for innovation, in terms of procurement, the, tra the transition to the next AMP and working digitally. Now, innovation, um, not surprisingly, last year attracted the lowest score, and that was because supply chain companies felt that the appetite for innovation wasn't as high. Um, the process for assessing and adopting innovation was not as good as they would have liked. The overall speed to adopt innovation was not as good, and collaboration on innovation and R&D and testing they felt was quite poor. So out of all the 11 questions, the innovation question attracted the lower score. And then that was followed by the questions on procurement, transition into the next AMP and working digitally. Now, as a result of the Innovation Fund and the Centre of Excellence and the work that's going on behind the scenes at Water UK and the water companies, we would imagine that the score for innovation would hopefully improve when we conduct the survey this year. And what British Water will be doing is forming a new um, sustainability task force. So we're going to be um, forming a small working group that is going to be assessing continuing issues that supply chain companies are raising, uh, just to ensure and check and see whether there's something that we need to be reporting back to the industry. So can I have, um, so actually before I go to the next slide, I just want to also touch on the fact that with regards to innovation, we partnered with MWH Treatment to, to produce an innovation map. And what that map does is it sort of simulates the journey that a supply chain company would take if they were to go, for example, onto Anglin Waters website, try and find out what innovations they were looking for um, through their portals and then email them or use the facility on the website and then get a response back. So on our website, there is an innovation map which basically sets out how each water company ranks or performs in terms of their innovation journey, if you were just coming in cold to their website. We do know that in preparation for the Innovation Fund, um, since we've done this work, some of the water companies have actually launched new supplier uh, websites. Um, so we had a water company laser meeting with United Utilities this week, and they said that they've, they've updated their supplier um, website, which is very good. So you hopefully you should be able to access that. So what we're trying to do is work with water companies to show them what the journey would be like if a supply chain company was to approach them through their website. And hopefully that will get them to tweak any areas that maybe aren't performing that well. So that's something that you can access on the British Water website. Can I have the final slide, please? So these are the questions that we're asking our members and other companies at the moment. So with regards to the municipal market, we're still asking, are you seeing significant delays to AMP7 projects? Um, and how do you deliver a condensed programme across four years? possibly working socially distanced on construction projects. This was something that one of our tier ones raised on one of the Better Together briefings that we had. Um, and it'll be interesting to hear if other tier one companies are also um, concerned about that. Um, so one of the things that we really do want to understand is, is, is what projects are coming through in App 7 and how is that information being relayed to the supply chain, particularly to those companies who are outside of the traditional sort of partnerships within the water companies. We're also going to be looking at cyclicality, whether the peaks and troughs is something that is still impacting the supply chain and whether this is something to raise again in the industry. We're asking with regards to the industrial market, are you experiencing a significant reduction in business? 
And as I mentioned, we'll be forming a new task force to look at whether we have a sustainable supply chain that will be able to contribute effectively to the green recovery, the net zero journey and the innovation fund. So that's the end of my presentation and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Lola. Um, I hope you can hear me. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, thank you for that again, a very comprehensive presentation. Um, and you really covered a lot there in a, in a short space of time. So just on, on the questions front, um, I might just kick off with a, um, with, with perhaps a, hopefully uh, a question that will ease you into things. Um, and it's actually from Lee. <laughs> Lila, what are the key benefits to companies if they join British Water? Yeah, okay, thank you. I didn't really cover that. I think one of the benefits of joining British Water is, is really around the connections that you get. Lee mentioned earlier that you have to approach different people or try different ways um, to get business within the water sector. You can't just um, call one person or meet one person and hope that that's going to translate into business. The way that we kind of describe it is touch points. So what British Water does is provide different touch points in order for companies to connect with different people within the industry. So we have seven water companies so far in membership, and that's really helped to strengthen the engagement between the supply chain and our members. So we organize water company liaison meetings and we organize one per month. And these are with each water company to provide an update to the supply chain in terms of the projects that are coming up, the kinds of solutions that they're looking for and the challenges that they're trying to address. Also at those meetings, um, the, water, the supply chain companies get to see um, organograms of their sort of senior leadership team and who's driving procurement and innovation. So those briefings are really, really helpful. And we're getting around sort of 50 to 80 people joining those calls, which is really useful. We also have a number of technical forum focus groups, which are on specific areas of the industry. So one on innovation, one on data and analytics, and members can freely, freely join these working groups, uh, these focus groups, and they discuss key issues, burning issues around those particular topics. And then they also develop codes of practice and the regulators also attend those meetings. So it's the fact that you can connect um, you can influence, we represent your interests to the key stakeholders, and we help to promote your products and solutions to key buyers in the industry. Great, thanks a lot. Um, Enterprise Ireland um, is actually a member of, of British Water as well, so I can personally attest to the, the benefits of, of being a member. Um, perhaps the next question that I might be, um, we, you know, we heard from Lee, uh, the water companies, uh, the water PLCs are looking to engage more with, with smaller uh, or, or tier two level uh, companies. Have British water members, um, has that translated into action with British water members of, of that scale? Is that something you're seeing happening in, in Amstead and so far? Yeah, I mean, we are seeing um, sort of some strong engagement from water companies with the tier twos that they're already working with. Obviously, as Lee mentioned, if you're not already on the, the radar, then you have to make sure that you get onto the relevant um, supplier lists or you start that engagement with the water companies. But um, I think one of the things that we're seeing is if you're sort of lower down in the supply chain, then definitely there um, are lags in terms of the projects that we're seeing coming through. Okay. Um... Next question on, is actually on innovation, Lilla, um, which I think you referenced uh, quite well in, in your presentation. Um, how important is the, the innovation to, to the industry in general and, and what role do you think Ofwat's £200 million innovation fund will, will play in addressing the, the needs of the sector? Um, and I know, look, you mentioned the, um, the innovation map that, that you've partnered with uh, NWH Treatment on. Um, you, you spoke about the sustainability task force that's been set up to just address any issues that the supply chain might be reporting in, in accessing the fund. Um, I'm just wondering um, what the response or, or, or the feedback has been thus far from British Water members um, regarding the fund. Um, I know finding a partner on the water utility side is, is, is quite often a key requirement. Is that proving a challenge or is the, is the innovation fund still finding its feet, do you think? Okay, you covered quite a few things. 
yeah. I'll, I'll start with the, the first thing. I mean, innovation is critical to the, the water industry. And I think to be fair, um, there is a lot of innovation going on. And I don't necessarily think that um, we're good as an industry at talking about the good stuff that we're doing. And um, and I think that, you know, I do know that water, some water companies or all water companies are doing something with regards to innovation. Um, but maybe uh, the message isn't going out as widely as it should be. And most people know of the Anglian Shop Window and other water companies initiatives like the Northumberland Innovation Festival. So lots of water companies are collaborating and doing things, but maybe the message isn't going out um, wider to the industry as much as it could do and hopefully that's something that will be addressed through the center of excellence and um, moving on to innovation the innovation fund the innovation fund should really be a, a game changer i mean one of the, the things around the innovation fund is yes you're right um, the water companies are driving the applications so therefore um, you have to be able to have um, contacts existing contacts in those water companies or ways in which to um, identify ways to work with them in order to put forward a, a joint bid to the fund. Um, but I know that um, the Nesta and the IOL and Arup, if you like, partnership have run a number of different brokerage events to connect startups and supply chain companies and others okay. to water companies to help them to understand the innovations that are out there. In terms of our, our, our members, it's too early to say yet. We will be assessing the num number of members that are applying for the fund, but at the moment it's too soon to say. Okay, thanks Lydia, for answering four questions in, in one there. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe maybe just one final question, Lydia, if that's okay. Um, we know um, the AMP cycles, as you, as you mentioned again in your, in your presentation, they, they tend to produce um, peaks and troughs for, for, for the supply chain. Um, what impact do you think um the pandemic and COVID-19 is, is likely to have on on the structure of the the asset management um programs going, going forward from into AMP 8 and, and beyond do you think that there'll be a change in in how spending is structured and do you think that the industry will be looking to avoid those peaks and troughs in the future it's um well this is something I've discussed with um Rachel Fletcher and others in the past um, it's, it's a big question. I, I think one of the, the things that um, I think will hopefully be good for the supply chain, because we've sort of seen the first year of AMP7 um, probably not sort of be delivered in a way that it probably would do if, if COVID-19 hadn't existed, we should see quite a lot of work coming through for the supply chain for the next few years. So hopefully that should be um, good, deliver good prospects for the supply chain in terms of the number of projects. I think in terms of the impact of COVID-19, it's something I know that um, of what is monitoring, as well as Water UK, I know that they had um, an, a sort of task force looking at the COVID-19 impacts. Um, but I think, and this is the impression that I've been getting from the water companies, and I know that um, the next speaker can correct me if I'm wrong, but the feeling is, is that work is starting to come through. As Lee said, it's a critical um, asset um, so I can't imagine that the projects are going to be heavily impacted probably the, some of the ways in which they're delivered yes I think there will be some changes definitely in terms of digitalization we do know that um, so for example when we had Southern Waters um, chief executive on Better Together last year he said they now had a digital strategy so we know that digitalization has kind of moved up the agenda across lots of water companies because they've had to do things more remotely. Um, so if you're into sort of remote uh, monitoring and sensors, um, then definitely we're seeing that um, there's increased um, interest in that and AI, um, machine learning and, and other solutions like that. So I think we'll see um, regula the regulatory changes in the sector and also we'll see um, more sort of digital solutions and technologies coming through. That's great, thank you Lila. Um, I'm just conscious of time, so I, I think that was the final question we, we had for you, but I would just again encourage people on the call if they, if they want to learn more about British Water and about the benefits of, uh, of membership, um, they, can, they can get in touch with, with you Lila and you'll be happy to talk to them uh, further, I'm sure. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you, Lila. So next up, we have Samuel Larson um, from Water UK to talk about the Net Zero 2030 sector route map. Hi, Sam. Um, hopefully, 
We can hear you. Yes, we can. Great. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks. And, and thanks for thanks for having us here to explain a little bit about uh, the net zero route map that the sector has been working on. So uh, good morning, everyone. I'll I'll try and keep this down to about 10 minutes, um, conscious really that uh, actually the next speaker has a lot of the pieces of the puzzle from the probably from the supply chain um, perspective. But hopefully in this next 10 minutes or so, I'll set out at high level what the industry has been doing um, to establish a, a net zero route map um, and why that's important to the next two amps or more um, in the water sector and how that will influence some of the activities that the supply chain will see flowing through uh, over the next few years. So if you want to take us to the next slide. So Water UK, as I think a couple of the speakers have already mentioned, the Water UK is the trade association that represents the water companies operating uh, in the UK in the main. Um, we also have associate members from elsewhere in the world and Irish Water is actually an associate member of Water UK as well. Now in April 2019, the UK water sector came together, uh, particularly those companies operating in England to make a net zero commitment. That is a commitment to reduce its operational emissions to net zero by 2030 um, and very consciously recognising that that was uh, greatly exceeding the UK's target of net zero by 2050. So really set in a strong pace uh, of ambition to get to net zero as an entire sector, an entire economic sector, um, collectively by 2030. Now that's significant because water companies are actually quite large. Uh, consumers uh, of, of things like electricity. Water companies currently use about one and a half to two percent of UK electricity in combination um, and they also have significant emissions coming from things like wastewater process. Um, so the net zero challenge uh, over the next decade is really quite significant and in itself makes quite a significant contribution towards the UK's uh, emissions reduction target. Now the sector's uh, made a lot of good progress in the past um, a 40% 40, 40 reduction since 2011, um, driven by its, its own work on things like renewables, uh, but also things like the decarbonisation of the grid, uh, the electricity grid moving on to greater renewables played a part in that. But also within the sector, the production of greater volumes of things like biomethane um, and, and seeing the benefit of displacing fossil gas elsewhere um, within the economy. So in November 2020, after, after about a year's worth of intensive work looking at the sector's 10 years worth of emissions data, we published uh, the sector's net zero route map. Uh, and I'll just deep dive into that a little bit and give you a bit of a uh, flavour of what's in the route map itself uh, and how that sets the, uh, sets the pace on net zero in the sector. Next slide, please. So this slide has a, has a time series chart there, breaking down our emissions. Um, uh, it's actually extracted from the route map itself. So if you want to know more about that chart, it's in the route map. Um, and if you just Google what UK uh, net zero route map, you'll get taken through to our mini site that has all the documentation and supporting evidence on it. But this time series graph, the, the red line across the top, shows how the sector's emissions have changed between 2011 and 2019, and that's that. 45% reduction in operational emissions that I mentioned earlier. So whilst that graph is encouraging and it shows that significant progress has been made, that isn't enough to reach net zero by 2030, even without taking into account some of the new demands that will fall on the industry from things like population growth, greater treatment standards, uh, and tackling some of the effects of climate change, such as uh, increased water scarcity and, and droughts, etc. So even without taking those things into account, there isn't enough pace in the, in the current baseline to get us to net zero. So essentially the sector has to do more to get to net zero uh, by, by 2030. Okay. Just, to, just to say a few words about where our emissions come from. Um, the majority of our emissions, as I've mentioned, come from electricity, but about a quarter of our emissions come directly from the release of methane and NOx from the from the wastewater treatment process and that's sort of an inherent part um, of the wastewater treatment uh, process at this stage and many of those treatment works that we operate were designed really to vent those products to atmosphere that was the technology that uh, that the industry is built upon um, and undoing that and changing that um, 
that that treatment path for the sewage from roughly 28 million homes is quite a significant challenge. On to the next page. So in the route map, um, we do several things. The first thing we do is we establish the BAU trajectory for the industry. So we've used that 10 years worth of data that the industry consistently collects. And we've used that to, to predict forward where the industry would be um, if it doesn't act strongly enough or quickly enough. And that's the red line shown across the top of this graph. Uh, and it shows some contributions coming in from things like um, grid decarbonisation, things like increased energy efficiency in the sector. But as you can see, that red line doesn't get to net zero by 2030. And then onto that picture, we have overlain the activities that the sector could take. And we've, uh, we've explored the effectiveness, the rate of deployment, uh, et cetera, uh, to work out what each of those measures could do to influence the sector's emissions. And each of those measures is shown with a, with a colored block. And in combination, as you can see towards the right hand side, those measures that the sector could take get us very close to net zero in this particular example. So in the route map, there are three of these calculations. We call them the pathways. There's one pathway that focuses on technology, new technology, greater deployment of new technologies into the sector, uh, things like greater biomethane production, things like greater energy efficiency, things like greater renewable generation within the sector um, to get us to net zero by 2030. And that one, that pathway, uh, gets us the closest to net zero of the three. The two other pathways, uh, one focuses on greater demand uh, management. It focuses on things like leakage reduction, things like um, changes to uh, uh, water consumption in homes, uh, things like energy efficiency, um, to make the industry more focused on providing the water that people need in the most efficient way. And, and that gets us close to net zero, but with some gap left to accommodate through things like offsets. And the final pathway looks at natural solutions, things like sequestration through tree plants in peatland restoration and grassland restoration. Um, and that one gets us about halfway to net zero from where we are today, but leaves a significant gap, a significant challenge uh, left to tackle. And all of these pathways are presented in the route map uh, in more detail. Next slide, please. So just to bring out the main interventions, and this is where it starts to get really interesting. This is, this is where we start to see the main changes that the industry will go through um, over the next decade. Uh, some of which are obvious, things like greater use of low emission vehicles in our fleets, uh, things like greater reliance on water and energy saving across the business, things like more efficient blowers, things like greater water efficiency in the home through white goods labeling, uh, greater efficiency standards for, for new build premises, but some less obvious. So things like tackling that process emissions challenge, uh, finding ways to reduce that, that venting of methane and NOx that inherently comes from the treatment of, of wastewater. Things like increased generation of renewable power, that's, that's things like solar, but also creation of more biogas, green gas, from the treatment of, of sludge uh, and potentially injecting quite large quantities of that into the gas grid to displace methane use in, in homes and hard to abate um, industrial heat scenarios such as glass making and steel making. And also um, some natural, natural solutions which will contribute towards our uh, journey to net zero. So those nature-based solutions for things like treatment, so uh, the greater use of things like reed beds rather than concrete and steel uh, treatment solutions, planting trees to sequester some of the carbon to close that gap between the operational emissions and net zero, the restoration of peatland and grassland, those are really important stores uh, of carbon in the UK, uh, and some water companies are significant landowners or work with other landowners with significant opportunities to, to, to restore peat uh, and, and restore grassland uh, to sequester carbon in soils. But also taking catchment based approaches. So, so many people will be familiar with the, with the story around end trade, and that is taking greater measures to reduce pollution at source rather than the ever increasing 
uh, reliance on concrete and steel treatment solutions to remove that pollution further down in the catchment uh, and working with uh, other, other uh, entities in the catchment to control the amount of pollution at source rather than investing uh, resource and energy um, in removing that pollution further downstream. Final slide, please. So just to, just to segue over to, to David, who's also been a, a very important part of the production of the route map. I know he's going to talk about the supply chain, some of the next steps that you'll start to see coming out as a sector. Um, we have now the plan that we've published, which sets out how the sector could get to net zero uh, by 2030 at sector level. And it produces uh, three pathways that sets out how the, how the companies could do that. And right now, individual companies are developing their own granular plans, their own individual company plans to get to net zero, acting now where they can, uh, pursuing things like those renewable schemes, uh, electric vehicle trials, et cetera, um, to make a start now on that transition to net zero. The industry is also engaging with the supply chains, uh, and Leela uh, was, was very helpful on her references to net zero in her, in her presentation earlier. Um, and working across the supply chain on net zero is hugely helpful. And I know David will touch on that a bit more a bit later. But also engaging with regulators on PR24, it's becoming increasingly clear that the next regulatory period will include far greater focus on climate change than has been the case in past periods. Uh, perhaps in past periods, bills uh, had great emphasis. Uh, but the early signs from off what's emerging thinking on PR24 is that climate change and tackling climate change by taking a medium term view, a longer term view of the assets needed in the water industry, uh, climate change will be much greater focus in PR24. We're also aligning with other sectors, um, lots of alignment between the water industry and the government's 10 point plan to get to net zero or, or the prime minister's 10 point plan to get to net zero. Uh, including things like a hydrogen economy, but also aligning with a sixth carbon budget, which sets out very usefully how things like waste, fuels, and electricity, energy efficiency form part of the UK's transition to net zero by 2050. So a lot of going, a lot of work going on to align with the uh, sixth carbon budget at the moment. And finally, the industry will produce in July this year um, its first year's progress report. So we'll be setting out how we're getting on uh, in delivering that transition uh, to net zero in great deal of detail in a report uh, in July. And I think um, that's, that's all I need to say at the moment. I know, I know David's going to cover some of those supply chain points uh, in much greater detail. Hi, Sam. Thanks for that. Uh, just making sure you can hear me all right. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, so a few questions coming through. Um, so just a question here. Um, you mentioned offsets, and uh, we we're just wondering whether what what's your opinion on offsets and whether they should kind of be used or, or viewed as a last resort um, after trying to reduce carbon emissions in other ways. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And in the route map, we set out uh, a hierarchy um, where we take all the measures that we can within the sector to directly influence our own emissions first and only mm -hmm. pursue those offsets, purchased offsets in particular, um, as that last resort. And each of those pathway graphs that I showed, those beautifully colourful blocks, uh, actually show the offset being taken after all of the individual measures have been deployed within the sector. Okay, lovely. Um, and then just one, you mentioned the Prime Minister's 10-point plan. Do you see stronger regulation coming in possibly um going further than the 2050 target that might affect the sector uh, coming down the line um that might encourage people to take that step on their carbon reduction journey yeah it's a great question and i think i think we're already starting to see hints hints around the edges of government uh that some of the really big uh moving parts are starting to turn so we're starting to see um, more, more emphasis being put on the climate change levy, which currently is added to the cost of electricity consumed, but not added to the co cost of natural gas consumed. And we're starting to hear from government already that that climate change levy might move either in small parts or in one big part 
um, from electricity to gas. Now that in itself uh, creates a very strong incentive. So electricity becomes much cheaper as a fuel, uh, mm -hmm. whereas gas becomes much more expensive as a fuel. Um, but all sorts of other policy pieces around government already starting to move. Now they have huge impact on society, um, really major impacts on society and no sector uh, will be untouched by those sorts of changes. So I think maybe to Lila's point earlier, it, it's really important that the supply chain stay really close to the industry, you know, through this transition um, so that we can help sort of map out some of those impacts before they arrive. Okay. Interesting. Thanks for that. And then just one final question, just in the interest of time. Um, what do you see as the main barriers uh, for the industry as a whole to hitting the 2030 target and what can be done um, within the sector to tackle these barriers? Yeah, it's a great question. I, th I think there is a risk in, in the UK territory as a whole, moving to net zero very quickly, as it must do. There is a mm -hmm. risk that government will have to move faster than it's used to moving. It'll have to develop policies with much less consultation uh, than it would usually do because it simply doesn't have the time. Um, and there is a risk that things will be less coordinated than they could otherwise be. I mean, one a couple of examples of question areas for me, one is biomethane policy. Um, yeah. You know, are we as a society getting as much value out of biomethane production from wastewater as we possibly could? Uh, we argue the government could probably do a bit more there, but also hydrogen. Uh, and has the has has the UK got a solution for hydrogen um, that doesn't require something like 15 or 20 percent extra water to be produced for electrolysis? So lots of lots of opportunities for getting things going quickly, but also lots of opportunities for making mistakes between sectors. That that means we miss the best way of getting to net zero as a territory. Okay. Lovely. Uh, thanks for that, Sam. Uh, and thanks for giving us great insight into the Net Zero 2030 plan. Uh, and it brings us on nicely to our next speaker. So I'll just pass it over to David. Um. Yes. Uh, yes. Good morning, all. I think it still is morning. Um, yeah. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm David Riley, Head of Carbon Neutrality within Anglian Water. Uh, so hopefully Luke is going to put uh, some new slides on there. We can go straight to, straight to the first slide. Um, the, the first thing I'll say is that um, Anglian Water has had a lot of success in this area, and that success is due to our supply chain. The opportunities that they've brought forth to us and how we've responded to those opportunities against the challenge of, of delivering against uh, both climate change and population growth in our region. And our challenge is around how do we significantly reduce carbon. And we've reduced carbon by about 61% from a 2010 baseline by 2020. And we've reduced operational carbon by around about 34% over the last five years. So we've seen some great success in there. But I will repeat that actually a lot of that success is due to the alignment of our supply chain and the opportunities that they've brought forward. So one of the key things that, that we look at is, so why is it important to, to reduce carbon? What are the key drivers on there? Because this is really about behavior change as much as anything else. And we know within the region that we operate in that uh, we get about two thirds of the average annual rainfall. We've got a significant coastline. So that puts a lot of our assets at risk as sea levels rise. In fact, 30% of our region is below sea level. So how do we respond to those environmental challenges and the significant population growth that we will see uh, over the next few years um, and also reduce our carbon emissions? So if you go to the next slide, we can see that we've actually set some leadership targets in place. And along with other water companies of England, as Sam has said already, we've got that uh, target of a net zero carbon emissions by 2030. But we've also got a target of a 70% reduction in capital carbon from a 2010 baseline. And the differences there are capital carbon relates almost to capital cost. So it's the materials that we are used when we're building, maintaining our infrastructure and operational carbon are those day to day emissions from fossil fuels, grid electricity and nitrous oxide and methane from our wastewater processes. But the key thing that we have and, and the, the evidence that we have are, is a causal link that exists between where we reduce carbon and we reduce cost. So this is not a tick box exercise. This is where we challenge on both carbon and cost. And we see a, a matrix here which illustrates that point perfectly. 
So in the top right hand side of that quadrant are a number of schemes that we delivered through the last AMP where we've delivered both reductions in carbon and cost and we challenge on both. So that is not easy to get to. It requires a framework to be in place and it requires close collaboration with our supply chain to deliver it because simply asking for a low carbon solution and not expecting to be able to challenge standards, specifications or, or the way we work does not result in significant carbon reductions. And I'm going to go through some illustrations of what that framework looks like and some of the examples that we've seen over that period of time. So next slide, please. So in terms of the, uh, of the actual framework itself and some of the behaviors that we look at, I'm hoping the next slide comes up. Yeah, there we go. So there's three key areas that, that we really focus upon, and that's around the leadership piece, both leadership within our organization to set the clear ambition and target and the leadership that we see from you, our supply chain, in terms of responding to that. We also see about the culture and behaviors, sharing the great news, successes that we see, recognizing that people are at the heart of actually delivering a lot of these low carbon solutions that we need. And again, the importance of our alignment of our supply chain and the commercial contracts that we have in terms of sharing both the reward and the risks involved in delivering some of those low carbon solutions. And I've got to say again that the the, the supply chain that we have with our alliance partners and beyond have come up with some great solutions over the last 10 years since we've been looking at carbon in a significant way. Uh, next slide, please, Lou. So one of the key things that uh, we've seen materialize over the last few years is around that digital revolution and the digital revolution being able to transform the way that we are both designing and constructing our assets. So this is an example of a scheme that we built in 2014, which was a low carbon solution at that point in time using uh, standard products, uh, offsite build, et cetera. Um, but through that, that, uh, that CAD drawing you can see there, we still identified that a significant proportion of our infrastructure was still buried. Move that forward to Dalton Pearcy in 2017, and you can see a similar sort of asset, but actually burying none of those assets underground now, a lot of the above ground assets in terms of that design. And that just illustrates and gives you a pointer towards where we see a lot of future opportunity lying in that digital world about measuring carbon and cost, um, taking that forward to making the right investment decisions. So where you in the supply chain can help us in terms of that digital revolution, that would be great to hear. Because where we can see before we've actually built an asset, where the carbon hotspots are, how we reduce those, and how we take forward to build it right first time on site. That, that is part of the carbon journey that we are on. Next slide, please. So this is all also about the materials that, that we consume. So when we start our carbon journey off, we recognize that around about 80% of our carbon emissions in construction lay within the concrete and steel. So it's something that we've focused a lot of our efforts on. And in fact, we've used some great Irish suppliers like Carlo Precast in terms of some of the construction activity that we've done in the past. Um, and that's because they've been aligned with our thinking around delivering low carbon solutions. So when we look at concrete, we recognize that, that that is around about five to 7% of global emissions. So it's a significant source of carbon, but it's also a great material that we use. So how do we carry on using that great material, but reduce carbon significantly? And that is through use of new products and new, new construction techniques, but also looking at how we can actually take cement or look at zero carbon or low carbon concretes. There's lots of work going on both within the sector, but also the wider supply chain through lots of the Green Construction Board, looking at low carbon concrete route maps. But this is just an illustration where the supply chain can come up with opportunities and ideas to change, radically change the sorts of materials that we are using. That's where the door is now open when we have the carbon lens on those types of solutions. Um, next slide, please. And as, as Sam uh, said, one of the pathways and an important pathway to get to net zero is around renewable energy. So lots of water companies are currently investing in optimizing their AD plant, their aerobic digestion to, to maximize the opportunity around biogas. 
Um, we've looked at onshore wind in the past, and that if you look at the uh, 10 point plan, that wind is coming up again. Um, but a big program of works are underway at the moment, especially around solar. In fact, one of the uh, pictures on there is the latest scheme that was, in, was energized within Anglian Water back in September, and that was an 11.4 megawatt peak solar array. In there, you've got around about 250 miles of cables, just to give an illustration of the size and scale of the installation that we see there. And that's what many water companies are up to at the moment in terms of looking at how they can maximize renewable energy on their operational sites and private wire into their operational works. Um, next slide, please. So we'll see on this slide that it's not just about renewable energy generation, it's also looking forward to how we integrate storage into that as well. And what this slide is about is the different types of energy storage technology that exists and how the water companies are looking to trial those different technologies. And here we see about a lithium, uh, here we see about a vanadium flow machine. And that is a, a different type of energy storage, which we are just trialing on one of our sites at the moment and looking to integrate renewables in there. So what that basically means is that we take advantage of that renewable energy when the sun is shining or the wind is blowing. But when the sun goes down or the wind stops, we can then compensate that because we've charged up our energy storage and then we can uh, re provide the power to that site through that, that energy storage means. So it's really that, that thinking that uh, the supply chain can come up with where how do we use renewable energy more and more on our operational sites to avoid that, that grid electricity where we can. Um, next slide, please. So as Sam also said, one of our biggest challenges we face around the net zero target is the process emissions, those nitrous oxide emissions especially that appear from what is now a hundred year old technology in terms of aeration. So the opportunities here, what water companies are undertaking at the moment as part of the route map is to improve our knowledge about where those emissions lie. So what are the actual quantities? How do we balance the science against the action that we need to take. So there's lots of measurement and monitoring going on at the moment. And then it's looking at a different technology such as MABR, where we know that those technologies will be able to reduce those process emissions, but not eliminate them. So well, this is where the, the importance around the uh, Offwatt Innovation Fund, which Lila mentioned previously, and how the, the sector transform and use in innovation to really tackle some of the biggest challenges we face. And one of those is around those process emissions. So again, anything you can do to help us in terms of reducing those process emissions, which will be around about 60% of our total emissions in 2030 is gratefully received. And those are one of the target areas that we face and we are challenged with within our own innovation teams. Uh, next slide, please. So again, Sam mentioned about hydrogen and especially green hydrogen. We, we say it's the fuel of the future and it always will be. And that's not a statement that we wanna to live to because we do need to unlock hydrogen. So where we have an increase in the scale of renewable energy that we're putting onto operational sites, where we've got spare energy that we can use, that that's, that's a great mix with, with that green hydrogen opportunity. But there is the challenge around how we consume water in a sustainable way, and then also take advantage of green hydrogen. But that, that is one of the key areas that we are, we are focused on. Um, next slide, please. So where the supply chain also come to play is that when we see success in delivering sustainable solutions, there's been a drive in terms of financial markets, especially the debt markets, where they're looking to invest in sustainable infrastructure. And those organizations can, can illustrate that they are doing the right thing. And then back in 2017, Anglian Water were the first utility to issue a sterling green bond to a value of 250 million pounds. In fact, now we've issued uh, sterling green bonds in excess of 800 million pounds. So it's, it's something that has continued since that starting point back in 2017. Now we're only able to issue those sterling green bonds because of the, the value and the opportunities that's been driven through our supply chain in terms of delivering those sustainable solutions against the challenges that we set out. So that this is where it's not just about the products or service that you provide, 
it's more about the systems thinking approach to recognize that it goes simply beyond that. Where we're able to deliver those sustainable solutions, we can also go to the financial markets and, and issue things like sterling green bonds, which is, which is a really important place. Um, next slide, please. So this isn't also just about uh, what the water companies are doing. It's about that cross-sector collaboration that exists. And we've seen more and more great examples of both circular economy, uh, nature-led solutions. Uh, we've seen examples of uh, cross-sector collaboration, such as what I'm showing on the screen right now. And this is about exploiting low carbon heat. So if you searched low carbon farming or, or Anglian Water Oast House Ventures, you will see a great example in a video here of where enormous glass houses are built in both Suffolk and Norfolk, and there's two now under construction, if not finished, where rather than using a conventional fossil fuel CHP set to heat those greenhouses, they're taking the what was waste heat or effluent discharge back into a water course. They're taking that low grade heat and converting that and then supplying it into those glass houses, reducing carbon emissions by around about 75% in what will be seen as growing around about 10% of UK tomatoes. Now that's an example of great collaboration that exists between the water sector and agriculture. And what we need to identify is where there are other cross-sector collaborations available to us. And if we can have the final slide on there, again, it just highlights the importance of collaboration across the value chain. Because when we have suppliers, designers, us as asset owners, the regulators, government and, and customers all aligned against the carbon challenge, be it net zero or reductions in capital carbon, that's when the magic is unlocked. And that's where we see significant reductions in both carbon and cost. And there are tools out there that I would recommend you go and see, both the Infrastructure Carbon Review, looking at a leadership document, but also PAS 2080, which highlights the framework that I've been talking about and how the supply chain can be aligned with the thinking of those asset owners in terms of delivering those low carbon solutions and become part of the solution. Now, those are great tools. And when you read through the Water UK Net Zero route map, and I, as Sam said, I would recommend that you do look at that, you will see where the real opportunities are over the next 10 years, because the challenge to deliver against net zero is an enormous mountain to climb. And we do need your help in terms of delivering against that challenge. Thank you. That's, that's, the, that's the final slide, Luke. Uh, thanks for that, David. Uh, great presentation and good to see the importance of collaboration across the sector. Uh, we have had a few questions come in. So the first is actually from Lee. Um, David, how does the relationship between replace assets and refurbish assets impact on reduced in carbon? So that's a great question. That's why it's important to look at both operational and capital carbon, because it's not just about the, the energy requirement of that asset. It's also about the carbon that's emitted in its construction. So the extraction of that raw material out of the ground, fabrication in the factory, delivery to site, and then the construction emissions associated. So when we're looking at uh, replace or we're looking at uh, new or refurbish, we have to take all those options into account, and we do. So as we're going through, what is the outcome that we are looking to deliver? So it's almost a hierarchy of things that we go through. It's do we actually need to build a new asset or do we need to refurbish that asset? And then it's going through, can we reuse the asset? Can we use a low carbon type of material? How do we reduce waste? So that's the hierarchy of thinking that goes through the engineer's mind. And our role is to actually provide the data so we can make the informed decision and we have strong governance in place to right, make those right investment decisions as well. Lovely. Uh, so then another question here, is there any guidelines in how to calculate your baseline carbon measures and changes applied? Yes, great question. So baselining is an absolute vital part of, of a, a low carbon framework and an effective low carbon framework. So. Back in 2006, Anglian Water developed around about um, 1,600 carbon models that went back to back with our cost models. And within our business plan, that's where we uh, not only created a cost baseline, we also created a carbon baseline, which was back to back with those cost models. 
So every single scheme has a carbon baseline associated with it that we challenge our supply chain against. And that data came from the University of Bath Inventory of Carbon and Energy. It came from different trade bodies that exist. And it also came from supplier data where it was available at that point in time. So the creation of those carbon models to create a baseline based on how we would have built an asset in the past and the materials that we used is a really important part of the framework. And there's more and more evidence and support out there and different tools like the Moata tool from Mark McDonald coming through. But the, it's a great question because baseline is something that has been missed in the past by some organizations starting on their carbon journey. Lovely. Thanks, David. And then do you see Anglia moving away from the 100 year old aerobic system in the next 10 years? For example, direct anaerobic treatment of wastewater or others? And how? The, the how is the great question, isn't it? Because the, the reason why that, that 100 year old technology is still in place is because it works. Now, it is far more efficient in its process than it was 100 years ago through changes in processes. Uh, fine bubble aeration, etc. But in, in general terms, in terms of the science behind it, it's still the same sort of technology. Now, what can we do differently? Well, that's where pathfinders come in, that's where proof of concepts come in, and that's where working with the supply chain comes in. Because anything that we do has to also ensure that any effluent discharge to a water course meets very stringent standards. And that's where we look to different nature-led solutions now as well. So those nature-led solutions, and a great example is in Goldisthorpe. And again, if you searched online for in Goldisthorpe, you will see some of the, the examples of nature-led solutions on the way. But that, that doesn't happen within the water sector alone. That is the collaboration that Sam also talked about earlier with government, with regulators, and other landowners and different stakeholders to actually enable us to take advantage of those different technologies. Great, thanks, David. And then a question from Lilla. Uh, would you say that the sector already has the solutions and technologies it needs to get to net zero? We have the leadership, we have the ambition, but the, the technologies are, are out there somewhere globally. So you've got you've got different organizations like Waterstart, where that, that's that global search. And that, that's what's underway, Lilla. I think, uh, I think there are some technologies yet to be invented. And that's where our supply chain is so important in this space. We've laid out the challenge. Where are where are those technologies and processes that we need that we can uh, we can put in at scale and and commercially viable? And then just one final question from myself, David. Uh, what piece of advice would you give to our clients who haven't yet started on their carbon journey? Um, and also, how can companies go about improving their own carbon literacy if they're only at the beginning of this journey? So my starting point in all this is to, to, to inwardly reflect as to why delivering a carbon reduction is important personally and within the organisation, because the behaviours are an absolutely vital part of this, the belief and belligerence that is needed. Um, the next thing is there's plenty of information now out there when we started 15 years ago, this wasn't the case, but it is now. So what's on the screen in terms of the infrastructure carbon review and past 2080? Because a small supplier can be verified to past 2080 as a large asset owner can be. That's how it's been written. And then there's different tools, Thomas Telford Training and others. And there's lots of individuals with knowledge now to be able to share. The Sustainability Supply Chain School is another avenue to go down where lots of great information at all levels in that learning journey but the third key one is to take action take action on how we can reduce our need for fossil fuels and how we can actually eliminate these these emissions from our processes brilliant thanks david um i think we'll wrap it up there i see it's just gone half and um, thanks for that insight into um all the work being done to hit those net zero targets. It's also great to see some of the efforts of Irish companies and Enterprise Ireland clients uh, with the net zero technologies being put forward. Um, I will just bring you on to the next slide with our contact details. So firstly, I'd just like to thank all the speakers for joining us today. So Lee, Lila, David and Sam, we really, really appreciate you taking the time to speak to us. 
Um, I'd also like to thank all of you in the audience for joining us today as well. Um, it was a really insightful and useful session. Uh, if you have any questions about the webinar, uh, any questions about the UK water sector, or you just want to get in touch with myself or Dara, you can find uh, our contact details on screen here. You can also find uh, our social media handles. Uh, and I just recommend following us and keeping an eye out for any upcoming events. Uh, the, there is sure to be some in the next uh, few months. Um, and that's all I have to say on the issue. I don't know if you have anything else to add, Dara. Covered it all, Luke. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, so with that, I think all that's left to say is thanks for coming and have a lovely weekend, everyone. See you. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everybody.